Hi guys, and welcome back. Today I'm sitting down again with uh, Berlin Gravy, who is uh, somebody who I've worked with quite a bit behind the scenes. And Berlin is essentially um, an early startup investor, um, been in securities, wealth management, and venture capital his whole life, and also the owner of Trade Desk Advisors and Mindset Startup Academy, which really just teaches how entrepreneurs and founders on how to get the raise to get the projects off the ground. Berlin, thanks so much for coming back today. It was a great talk last time. I got a lot of really positive feedback on our video. Welcome right. and uh, glad to have you here. Well, thank you. I'm excited. Uh, I had fun on the last one. So looking forward to this interview. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to switch gears a little bit today and we're going to talk about regulation coming to blockchain because that's something that it's not happening. It's already happened. We've seen kind of recently the FATF and FinCEN come in and we've seen kind of the directives that blockchain has to use, AML, KYC. And it's a pretty big shift from where we were in traditional blockchain and I think just the whole act of regulation coming together is really going to kind of change the space. I guess to kick it off, Berlin, I, I really I work a lot in the EOS IO space, worked on multiple projects and advised multiple projects. Um, I've actually heard that typical VCs won't touch projects that have previously had token sales, as in like IC. Why do you think that might be? That's a good question. And I, and I think there are probably enough of those answers to keep us busy for a full hour, but I'll, I'll pick the top ones. And this is just sort of gospel according to Berlin here. Yeah. In, in relation to the attitude or catching the temperature, if we were to generalize, <clears throat> excuse me, about the early stage VC space or just early stage investor in general, if one has a token in their history, I think if I were a betting man, a majority of that falls under the category of skeletons in the closet. Meaning, because we are still, to your point, about a lot of activity from a regulatory standpoint, and definitely a lot more color and context, right? Yeah. However, would we say it is as defined as general securities right now? Not necessarily. And here's why. Although there is enough verbiage and content from our regulatory bodies about how they want to see tokens walk and talk, there's another component of regulatory aspects that I think tokens just don't have the luxury on, and that's case precedence, right? So it's one thing to create a law, and it's another thing to have that law actually tested. And so when, let's say that the start date of newer clarity was arbitrarily January 1st, 2019, a lot of VCs that we talk to who would look at a particular company that may have a token raise in the past prior to that date as essentially sort of a skeleton closet, right? Well, what do we mean by that? Well, let's say I'm one of those VCs and this company did some type of seed or pre-seed raise. They liked it and sort of, they learned a little bit more like we all do. Now they're in front of my team for a traditional raise and they happen to be doing shares. Well, when the regulatory, and this goes through precedence of other uh, asset classes like commodities and things like that, so we're, we're sort of looking to see what new emerging asset classes previous times, what their lifespan was. Well, when new regulation comes out, what is it going to do? Is it going to claw back to all past uh, token operations and expect some form of compliance and wrap up? Is it a grandfathered aspect? So these type of questions, that don't necessarily speak to the product itself, uh, the market interest, or its overall viability or scalability. It's this one thing in its past that could I spin it and say, it's not gonna be a problem? Sure, but the question is, is do I like that idea in this team enough to deal with that potentially? Putting that in the parking lot and kind of having it hang there. So I think for those startups and founders who have had a token experience in the past, although every investor is going to be different, I would be willing to bet that's where a lot of those who are making are prohibiting against those type transactions. I, I would bet that's probably a lot of what's going on in your head. Yeah. So more of kind of a regulatory risk perspective, which we'll, I think we address a little bit later on here in some questions. Yeah. And, and really not knowing, you know, when it all finally comes down and it says, you know, this is the blueprint. What if it comes back and it's, you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars 300000 worth of legal work, right? Who do you think is going to probably pick that up? The company's got just enough gas in the gas tank to get into the next gas station. 
So, so th- those are a lot of things that I think people are, each day that goes by though, as well, I think the VC space, I mean, we talked before about traditional, non-traditional capital, uh, traditional capital being, as you can imagine, just the traditional public private market entity participants. I think every day that goes by, each person, depending upon their relationship to token and blockchain, are becoming a little bit more familiar. They're testing these what-if scenarios internally, right? And as time goes on, they will be better prepared for that. So let's say five, six years from now, we still don't have the level of clarity as we do in most traditional securities. At least these teams have had the ability to sort of formalize a game plan for that. And hopefully that would then, you know, create a higher adoption rate of those types of scenarios. Yeah, that makes sense. We, of course, have a few different regulatory entities to deal with. You know, I mentioned FinCEN and I mentioned FATF, but right. one of those regulatory bodies, which you really can't deny, of course, um, is the SEC. And we've heard some really good things out of the SEC, um, particularly from Hester Peirce making some, some recent speeches on blockchain and how she has a personal worry that if they don't learn to adapt, that they may um, outregulate innovation right out of the space. So they're cognizant of some of this, but we also both know that the SEC is like one of these organizations that's pretty slow to adapt. And I think others tend to be as well. It was kind of a broad question. What are your thoughts on navigating the regulatory hurdles if you are in the blockchain space and you're building a project? Yeah. So in terms of, of, of navigating the regulatory hurdles and a hurdles is a, is a good way to describe it because I don't look at them as walls. Um, a hurdle is a good idea and a hurdle just takes a little bit of sort of preparation for this. So if we're a blockchain or, and or token related company that is looking to navigate these things, I think the first thing that they have to be able to do is begin to familiarize themselves with this process. And sometimes when you say that, people think, oh, God, who wants to really go read a bunch of legal jargon, right? Well, there are teams like us out there that help kind of break this stuff down. But if I were to, to try to summarize what those hurdles would be, there are a couple of different buckets. The first bucket that we have to get very familiar with is simply the act of soliciting an investor. That's a very key thing. So Within regulatory law in relation to capital raise, there are very specific rules about how you actually solicit people that you don't know. And where is that threshold? It's basically marketing in the public domain. So you got a lot of you know, token and blockchain companies who may have had successful or unsuccessful experiences with ICOs in the past that were popping websites up, right? That were using social media to or telegram to drive traffic traffic to these pages. That is something that would be a complete no-no unless you went through the proper regulatory processes to do so. So that's the first aspect that people have to understand. And there's a whole set of hurdles in there. Because think about it, when I strip away your ability to put up a public site in the public domain, and I strip away your ability to solicit on social media for investment purposes, that becomes a very difficult task, right? Yeah. You really have to have a tactical approach. I think some of the folks that have had success in the past via the ICO space, whether it was purely popularity, it was a very reactive mode, right? Throw enough message in front of a broad enough audience and hope that you get a small capture rate. Yeah. Soliciting in a regulatory capacity is sort of reverse. It's not reactive, it's proactive. Because if you strip away those communication components, you're going to be hard pressed to find anyone knocking at your door. So that whole aspect of dealing with those hurdles and how one puts together a proactive plan, how they understand who their target investment audiences are, how they think, how they operate, and how to target them is one. Number two is investor suitability, right? So now I follow the rules. I found this sort of bucket of, of investors who I'm targeting. Now we get into the whole area of accredited and non-accredited. And the onus is always on the founder to show what we call procedural prudence. And that is the necessary steps, reasonable steps that you went through with that person to better understand their occupational background, their investment related background, and some level of experience of what their financial credit worthiness may be. 
And if you look at it as a three-step process, there's solicitation, there's investor suitability, then there's the actual act of talking about the investment. And don't play, those, don't play a shell game with those because then you defeat the purpose. Yeah. So the, the three things when we have someone that is coming from a different industry, sometimes even coming from other uh, geographic areas of the globe that may not be familiar, and we need to sort of start from scratch, those are the first three things that we teach them in relation to the hurdles. And if you think about those three steps, it's no different than what you're doing in your business model. I always like to put it in a way that they may understand. You know, when you open up shop for your business, you don't open up the shop, turn on the lights and cross your fingers and toes and hope that a customer comes in the door. You got a marketing plan, right? You know their behaviors and you know how many people that you have to communicate with to generate a sale. You know how much that's going to cost you. Now, once you identify them, do you throw a sale at them in the beginning? No, you try to use a little sales 101, right? You try to build a little bit of rapport. You try to understand their needs. You need a selling models. Then at the end of that approach, then hopefully you go for the close. Think of, that's the way I like for founders to sort of think about it because when they're learning new processes, it can be overwhelming. It's always better to sort of tie it to something that they're already fairly familiar with. Yeah, that's a really good response and um, really detailed. I do think that the way in which we raise funds, even just based on what you said, is very much going to change. What are the major impediments? Well, I mean, depending on what your thought is, whether it's an impediment or what it might be, is of course AML KYC. So anti-money laundering, know your customer. That's one of the things that's really been pushed into the, the spotlight. And essentially, um, you know, FinCEN has said, if you want to do business in the US, you've got to do that. You've got to do transactional monitoring. You've got to be reporting. You've got to be a registered MSB and possibly a money transmitter. Um, but this whole kind of, and, and the FATF has essentially echo, echoed the same thing. Um, how do you think that AML KYC coming to blockchain is going to change the process of raising money and just perhaps even blockchain in general? Because it's kind of been indicated that this is the future and this is what you're going to have to do if you want to continue to build projects. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is, this is just my personal opinion, but what I always tell folks when I do talks is that from a, from a regulatory perspective, it is almost impossible for the SEC to define every single possibility that could happen. Right. Absolutely. They can't be in every boardroom. They can't be at every kitchen table when a startup is there. So uh, there is a, a certain amount of our security-related regulations, specifically in the acts of capital raise, that are sort of on the honesty policy, right? Yeah. Here are the rules. Go out there, follow them, and hope you don't get a call to the principal's office. That's essentially how it operates. And therefore, you know, in, in working with so many different companies, there's a lot of companies out there, non-blockchain, that aren't necessarily doing every single step they should be in terms of AML and KYC. Yeah. And I think every regulatory body knows that, right? But put yourself in the SEC shoes, right? You have all of Wall Street, the whole financial service sector. That's a beast amongst itself. You have trillions of shares trading hands. And then you got this guy over here in this small town, just about to take a $100,000 check from his buddy. Which one takes priority, right? So there are a lot of people and especially in the early stage space that aren't necessarily doing this. Here's the bad thing if you want to look at it this way for blockchain. Now that blockchain is boom, right in the crosshairs, a majority of it is financial related, right? It's, it's geared towards, in many aspects, the entire financial services and banking industry. So now you've picked the one hot button that the SEC is primarily focused on, and here's a new player at the door. So it's almost like the blockchain and token companies, in my personal opinion, have an extremely high prerequisite for AML and KYC, as opposed to the consumer goods guy who's creating an energy drink company five states over. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and, and in fintech particularly, any time the AML and the KYC processes are established, I think blockchain is, is most and well poised to simplify and streamline the process. But I do think that there are a lot of blockchain and, and token related companies that are looking at AML and KYC as if it's not sort of reflective of what they need to do, right? Oh, I'm not a, a fintech company. I'm not dealing in roles to financial transactions. 
But the thing about blockchain is a lot of the blockchain companies, I could make an argument to put them in three to four different industries. Founders have to be very, very careful with that. I'm always at the process of being super conservative. So even if I know, being intellectually honest with myself, that someone could put me into that category, then I'm going to put the necessary protocols in place for the KYC to AML. I do not think as a betting man that they're going away. I think they will only be amplified. Why is that? My personal belief is many people on my team. There are, to your point, SEC sort of changing its tune a little bit. It's This isn't a flash in the pan. This is going to be here to stay. Financial service and banking industries are fully aware of what the impact is going to be when the blockchain capabilities fully take. And I don't think that's something that the SEC, if I were them, would want to work on later. They're going to focus on a high level of criteria and, and mandates on that very early on in the game. So I think it's it's something that a lot of the fintech and the blockchain related companies need to pay very, very, very special attention to because I think it's on the radar. Yeah, particularly as we kind of alluded to earlier when it comes to regulatory risk. Um, I guess we'll get into data points, but can you kind of give a little bit of a basis, like what is regulatory risk and how might that be an impediment to raising money if maybe you are just kind of pushing aside some of these policies, like typically speaking, you're not really paying attention to AML, you're not really paying attention to KYC, you know, how might regulatory risk play into what you're doing from an investor's mindset? Okay, so if you're sort of taking your hands off the wheel in relation to your KYC or AML requirement. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good question because there are there are a majority of primary risks if we were to compartmentalize from a risk return relationship for investors. You know, there's market risk, team risk, product risk, technology risk, we can go on and on. Regulatory is a big one and it doesn't necessarily affect every company, right? But the way that you want to look at regulatory risk is direct risk and indirect risk, okay? So let's say, for example, let's use one of guns. We had someone that had a gun-related company that we had to review. They weren't necessarily a gun manufacturer, right? They were actually making apparel at a very high scale to a lot of the big boys that were associated with the products that were regulated. Well, one of the things that we had to draw up in that report was, as the founder was saying, well, I'm not in that particular. Well, theoretically, you're indirectly tied, right? A regulatory rule at a federal level which encompassed all states, came down and drastically limited the amount of those particular products being sold, and you have direct efficiency within your bottom line. So direct and indirect is the primary one. From a regulatory risk perspective, there are a couple of things that founders we recommend always have to do to display to an investor. The thing about understanding how an investor uh, understands or feels or gauges regulatory risk is no different than any other risk. Most investors are going to be aware that they are not immune. And I think that's a common misstep that a lot of founders take is they feel they have to almost make that investor immune from the risk. That can't be done. Your crystal ball is broken. And anytime we do that, we can come off as uneducated, unaware, or overly confident. So that's the first thing to, to really realize. Now, knowing that an investor understands he is not immune from risk, it doesn't take a genius to know that you're within or about to be within a highly regu regulatory industry. How is a founder to really help that investor get comfortable with my ability to take on that headwind? Well, there's a, basically it comes down to education and awareness. Every investor is going to be different. But if we were to try to find the most common denominators for investors in terms of how they want to see a founder take on risk, it's education and awareness. What does that mean? Understanding exactly who the regulatory bodies are that you have to respond to. And believe it or not, Matt, there's a lot of blockchain guys out there that couldn't tell you what every one of the agency acronyms means. That's a big deal. You need yeah. to know who's running those. You should probably know when they meet. You should probably know the systematic reports that they send out, and you should probably be familiar with the last three to four of them. You should get really familiar with how often those particular individuals within those regulatory bodies change seats. Are they lifetimes? Are they term limits? These are the types of details that a founder should really begin to understand 
and include in write-ups, as you well know, I'm not a big fan of of deferring off a potential risk. There's a risk and an honest, reasonable person says it's one, you call the elephant out in the room. And so by proving your awareness of what they are and your ability as a team to systematically follow up on those risks, take that data, sit down as a team and make a decision as to whether or not your regulatory risk plan needs to change, stay the same, or be reevaluated at a certain point in time. That very process is what we would refer to as procedural prudence. Why is that so important? When you are the fiduciary of your company and you've accepted capital from other individuals, you have taken one of the highest standards that you can possibly take as a fiduciary. You are personally liable for those pieces. And in a society like ours, unfortunately, where there is so much quick to litigation, you never want to be in a situation where you're caught in a he said, she said. How is a founder to best protect themselves? Procedural prudence, which means you can literally see my thought process and my intentions through every bit of activities that we've chronicled from a corporate governance perspective. If I'm in, a, in, a, in an industry like a blockchain where I've got a high regulatory risk component, amplified even more for the fact that it may even increase, I'm going to have a long document set out of my corporate governance. I'm going to probably share that with investors because I know they're thinking of it. And I'm going to share with them, these are the potential risks. These are the parties that could implement that. Here's how we monitor it. Here's how often we review these latest activities to determine whether or not we're still in the best hedge position. That's how you can make an investor feel more confident, maybe help them overcome the concern of regulatory risk when you can't simply wipe it off. Yeah, it makes sense. And that's one thing that we've spoken about a lot when we refer to, don't try to hide any elephants or skeletons. You want to bring them to the surface. You want to be honest with them because a lot of these investors are fantastic through their due diligence process and they're going to pick them up and they're going to find them anyway. So at least if you've taken the time to acknowledge them and built a plan to either assess them or at least monitor them, then you stand a much better chance of, of gaining their confidence, I guess, right? Absolutely. There's a tendency from founders that everything is candy canes and lollipops, right? Which is a, it's, it's a natural thought process to do. You don't want to show lack of confidence, but it's, it's not lack of confidence to also be able to point out particular risk factors that you could or will be facing and how you will plan to adjust them. I think those companies that can go on from pre-seed to a C to a series A with large step-ups in valuation of the company are ones that are extremely confident, hardworking, great leaders, but also, as as Mark Cuban once said on Shark Tank, in a constant state of paranoia. And and that sounds really unhealthy, but that statement always stuck out in my mind. It's how I am. It doesn't mean that you're sitting there biting your nails or crawling under the bed and pulling the covers over you. It just means that you're capable of multitasking, your head on a swivel. You're capable of managing four or five different things while at the same time looking at it through a lens of where the potential risks are and whether or not you're mitigating. Yeah. If you can display those type of capabilities, I think you can really separate yourself apart from other founders in front of the eyes of the investor. Does the way that investors um, kind of mitigate and assess risk, does that vary from investor to investor? And do you think that there's any like hard, what are the hard stops? Um, You know, of course there's going to be a lot of them and this is going to be very subjective from investor to investor as we've talked about. But if you were to kind of name maybe a few hard stops as it relates to the way that investors assess risk, what would those be? It's a great question. It's one of the things, reasons I have a job is that (laughs) Although they may have done define regulatory aspects fairly well, for founders, there's very little defined, right? There is no handbook that says this is the way an investor is going to handle this because every investment decision is a personal or corporate one. And it is streaming from a particular risk tolerance, right? And every investor is going to have a different risk tolerance. Every investor is going to have a different re that triggers them on certain things. So although we're reading from the same hymn book in terms of the risks, those are pretty common. If there is a hard stop or a default mode, I think, and we are trying to find the most cumulative approval from investors, it's probably not going to be your quantitative ones. You know, 
when we look at risk from the most macro perspective, you have quantitative and you have qualitative. Quantitative, of course, are things that you can put an actual metric number or percentage to. And then you have the qualitative aspect that are just as important as metrics and data points, but can't necessarily be distilled down to a number. Well, if I'm an early stage company, blockchain, token, regulatory, whatever it may be, and I'm in a conceptual to a pre-seed stage, I'm still catching my life. Most of the time, everything on the quantitative side of that table is completely hypothetical. Yeah, where do a lot of founders feel they need to push a majority of their time? on the quantitative. Well, a good investor, and I think majority would agree, in which you know we interview a lot of investment funds for Mindset Startup Academy, uh, to basically build a library to help answer questions like this because they are subjective. But from, from my findings through meeting with so many of our fellow investors is that they're going to put a high tilt towards the qualitative side of them. Because if I don't have a really good understanding of those qualitative aspects, then the hypothetical nature of your quantitative numbers may mean nothing. There's no foundation to them. So from a hard stock perspective, we can definitely put the cumulative, I'd say, preference from investors on the qualitative. And then if we were to unpack that a little bit more, about sort of what are the, the minimal prerequisites for those qualitative? Yes, it's, it's showing the proper charisma aspects that we've talked about before. But there are some other things that I think a lot of investors are going to look for that could move the needle. What do I mean by that? Well, we talked about one yesterday, you and I, and that's product defensibility. That's a major data point metric within most investors. And better believe it, if there's someone else out there in the marketplace that could theoretically duplicate what you do, there's a major component within your business model that you can't wrap around IP or trademark realistically. And you don't have a good story of how you are going to defend that lack of differentiation on your product side. That's a hard stop for a majority of investors, I would say, right? Because if you can't prove to me what the game plan is, and again, I'm not asking you to make your risk go away. That's impossible. But what are you going to do here? Because if you do go out and achieve the the market capture that you're talking about, well, then those big boys are going to squash you like a bug. If you're really as good as you're saying you are. And so that's where a founder gets himself in a, you know, damned if you do, damned if I don't, right? If I don't, I don't want you anyway. And if I do, you haven't proved a good answer why they're not going to come each take your lunch money. So that would be a big one. The second one that I don't think enough founders really focus on, that's an absolute hard stop for a lot of investors, is offense and defensive trap. We talked about this on the night before as well. Yeah. I think nine times out of 10, founders have a great offensive strategy. Here's my go-to-market. Okay, what's your defensive strategy? And then it usually goes crickets. Meaning, you are as good as you say you are, and you did begin to implement. Now, here's the problem with it. Now, you're on the radar. Now, people are following. So, here you are burning capital like it's going out of style. You've got a new little widget. And... And you've underpriced the majority of the competitors in the marketplace because you're lean and mean and you're moving. And you got a little too good at it. And here comes one of the big boys and goes, you know what? Why don't we just take that product he's competing with and let's just make it a loss leader? Screw it. It's going to cost us less to basically just lose money on this particular product. But I could basically stop this market share. I could stop him dead in the tracks. And here comes the big competitor and all of a sudden, boom, your price cut with all their volume and scale. And now a founder is basically pushing a rock uphill. So understanding what your defensive strategy is, is not a blueprint because people can't expect you to know what's going to happen in the future, but you have to prove to investors that you've had those thought experiments and what were your answers. So from a hard stock perspective, you would be hard pressed to find an early stage investor that doesn't have a prerequisite set or schedule hanging in the qualitative side of the fence. Because if all the qualitative aspects are all put together well in house, it's a natural inclination that the quantitative side will make sense, right? Yes. That's where I think a lot of the hurdles are. And a lot of the hurdles aren't that, oh, I didn't like your answer. That could be the case. Unfortunately, a lot of the founders fail to meet the minimal hurdle because they simply haven't even thought about it. They haven't even prepared for that concept. And so when it comes up, in, a, in a, an investor due diligence process, let's say, like we teach in our academy later on down the line, and you don't have an answer for it, that's, 
that's typically where the wheels start to fall off the bus. Where do I find these investors? Is there like some sort of online investor shopping mall or that <laughs> happens? They hang out at ice cream parlors. Like where exactly does one go to solicit investors? Where do you find these guys? Uh, that's, that's the number one question. I think, you know, and speaking to a lot of other investors and, and, and we can't knock them because we've all been there, yeah. but it, it does kind of get to be a little bit nails on the chalkboard at times when a founder approaches you or kind of sweet talking to you a little bit. And the bank comes to pitch. And when you're not interested, then the question a lot of founders are asking is, well, do you know anyone? Or, you know, through any form of social media, do you know anyone? And I always make it a point to talk to them and say, how is that process working for you? And if they're really honest with me, well, say, well, let's unpack this. And sorry for the long answer, but this is a big one for me. <laughs> because it's 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 a major question for most founders, but I think they're going about it wrong. I said, let's think about this. What what types of people have you asked that question? About? And usually it's people that they believe are very well connected. Also, a lot of times mean they're probably very busy. So what you're really asking someone to do is expend political capital in your behalf. Well, most of those people are successful for a reason. They're not going to expend their political capital without understanding what they're passing along. But really what that question was, was would you take a couple hours out of your week to review this package? And should you like that package, will you expend political capital on me to actually create an introduction? And sometimes it could be feel a little standoffish. And I said, now, that's not to, to, to downtrodden what you're doing. But a better question is not do you know anyone to pass me along to, but can you help teach me how to build a network like you did? That's the same question. It may not be immediate satisfaction, but you will catch more bees with honey in that approach. Or bears money because here's the thing is what you're asking someone to do and expending political capital if it doesn't go wrong is the risk really worth the reward for that person now it's not to say this is your friend your neighbor your buddy from college of course i do that kind of stuff but if you and i don't have a lot of rapport what you're asking is far greater than what you may think the other way to do it is is there's an old adage that i always follow when finding investors and that is ask for money get advice ask for advice get money a lot of guys like me in my position are happy should we have the moment to provide free advice or idea or point in the right direction. Far more, let's say, than the people that you come up to and they go, oh, yeah, absolutely. Where's my checkbook? Yeah, here you go. That's a complete rarity. Better chance of winning the lottery. So if that's the reality that I'm going to face, and to your point, I need to find hundreds of them, then you might want to think about changing up the tack. And this isn't a shell game approach. It's that when you ask someone for advice or direction or how did you do it, or if you were me, where would you go? That kind of thing. What you're doing is you're allowing those walls to come down a little bit. If they're engaging in that question, then they naturally have to ask questions to figure out who you are. What you're looking for is you're looking for an indirect way for them to better understand who you are and you let them make the decision of whether or not they're going to introduce you. So that is the first thing when it comes to finding investors that I would like to see more founders do is, is understanding that difference between asking for money and asking for advice. I had a founder ask me not too long ago, okay, well, what would you rather have more? 12 investors ready to write a check or 12 really influential people willing to provide advice? I said, I'll take door number two, hands down, every day of the week. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That little bit of shift is the big one. Now, Let's say you've got that component rolling in the background in your investor marketing strategy. The next thing we got to do is we have to figure out what types of investors are best suited for you. And you have to understand the differences in investors. What do I mean by that? Well, you've got three primary components, a million shades of gray in between. You've got your early stage VC guys and ladies. You have your angel groups and then you have your individual accredited investors. Every single one of them, according to the solicitation and investor suitability requirements we talked in the beginning, have to be treated the same. But when you get to that third component where you're actually going to start talking about the investment offering, they can be slightly different. VCs and angel groups, there are plenty of databases. We're going to be doing a class on our Slack channel, uh, the paid Slack channel we're creating for February 2020. We're going to be doing one on Crunchbase, which is a tool that a lot of us use. I think some founders know what it is. They just don't know how to utilize it. So 
what you have to do is you have to be able to learn these particular databases. They're paid, but some of them you get away with free. PitchBook's another great one. And you have to be able to understand who your investor audience is. You know, so when, when we do consultative work with a company, as you know, one of the things we do when we're all done and we've got them all dressed up and ready for the big dance is we'll use the tools and we'll generate a few hundred names for them. Say, here's the funds that you need to target and here is why. These are the industries that they're stating that they're interested in. Look at the portfolio of companies they've invested in in the last 10 years. Do you see anything similar to what you're doing? Or maybe they're not similar, but here's the angle of that I would take because I think that they could be positioned well for you. Look at the average check size that they write. Some early stage VCs like to be a lead investor. They like to lead the round, meaning they're probably going to write a check 10 to 30% of the entire offering. Then you have other VCs who would rather be follow-on investors or minority investors, which means they're going to be writing checks of 150 to 300,000. So just right there and how I broke down the VC space is critical to where founders are going to point their compass and expend their energy. Because if I've got a $3 million raise and I went out and I generated a list and I go, oh, well, they're VCs. And really what you did is you put a bunch of VCs that are all follow-on minority investors with average check sizes of 150 to 250. And you put in all that work over six months to find five that were interested, you really only gathered up 800,000 of your $3 million of checks. And a majority of them aren't going to give you $800,000 until you figure out that you have an ability to close the full three million. See what I'm saying? Same thing for angel groups. Sometimes founders will say, well, I'm going to focus on angel groups. VCs, that's a little too specialized. You know, They're kind of vultures. And I'll say, well, wait a minute. And now let's let's look at angel groups. 80% of angel groups in the United States are volunteer groups. They, they are a collection, not necessarily in every instance, an actual full fund, which means they're not going to have a lot of people there to answer. You, know? you might have a little bit slower response time, and you might have a little bit slower uh, time it takes to actually formally engage, unless there's some of the very big angel funds. Then you got to consider the fact that angel funds write a very smaller check compared to a lot of bigger VCs. Credit investors, same thing, very difficult to follow. Average check size is even far less. So you've got some particular founders that only focus on accredited. Well, if I got $3 million to raise and I'm picking it up at 10,000 bucks a pop, I got to get 300 of those guys. So where you find them can start with the crunch bases and the pitch books of the world. That's a great start. But you want to team up with someone like a, what we teach folks that will teach you how to utilize and harness the horsepower of those tools, right? It's yeah, one yeah. thing for me to give you a bunch of data, but it's another thing if you don't know what the hell to do with it. So that would be the first thing. So at least you know, it says, hey, of the 6,000 professional investor funds that exist, here's the population of 500 that would have the highest likelihood of being interested in what I'm doing. And now we're going to start rolling out our proactive investor marketing plan to them starting with little bits of information, hoping to engage an intro call, feed them a little bit more data. Then they're probably going to tell me to submit through their website. So I got to have that data ready. Then I got to know when to follow up after submission, hope for an in-person, you know, the process of the dance. So, but that's just your professional investors. Then you got to look at accredited investors. There is a number of ideas and philosophies on the web of where you find these guys. But where I see most founders have the most success is starting within their own natural market. And here's where I get into a dirty word for a lot of uh, founders when I say friends and family, right? A lot of people do not want to mix. But I think a lot of them, when I say friends and family, immediately think about picking up a check from their cousin or their uncle, which they would rather go jump on a lake. But go back to the adage, ask for advice, get money. Utilize those people who you know have a high propensity to be able to be an advocate for you and figure out how those folks can identify individual people within their lifestyle, within their network, within their folks in their work, within their folks in social media. But you need to give them direction, right? So this all comes down to how you build your investor marketing plan. Let's say I'm a blockchain company and I have $3 million to raise. First question I'm going to ask you is, okay, what's your minimal investment? Meaning, what's the smallest size check you're going to accept? And a lot of founders might come back and say, well, $100,000. I don't, I don't want to break my back here for $100,000. Okay. 
average American has less than five hundred dollars in their bank account. Median income in the United States is fifty six thousand dollars. The average person by their fifty has less than half of that savings. If you want a hundred thousand dollar check, you're talking about a certain caliber of our population, right? These are individuals that are probably going to be accredited investors. They need to have average incomes uh, if they're married above three hundred fifty thousand. They should be living in particular areas that have a higher standard of living, which shows you they have high discretionary income. This is the level of detail that you want to hit your target that you have to do. So with that particular amount of data, then you can begin relying on people in your network or people that you find in LinkedIn, not asking for a check, not saying, hey, do you know any investors? What am I supposed to do with that? You could be more of the sniper-like approach. Hey, so-and-so, good to hear from you again. This is what I'm doing. This is something I spent the last three years working on and harnessed everything. And I'm looking for a little assistance. Would you have to know anyone in your network that looks like this? See that, see that change? Like if, we, if, if, you, if I was your buddy from college and you said, hey, you know any investors? I'm going to go, oh, no. But if you said, hey, I'm looking to build a workshop and I'm going to do a small little dinner for people over in the Los Angeles area, between these area, who are usually professionals within finance companies, doctors, accountants, things of that nature. Now I can get that person's brain triggering more, right? So if I have enough of those advocates providing advice and finding, then you got to keep working that angle. So we look at it as two components of the marketing plan for companies. One is hitting the non-professional investors, and the second component is hitting the professional investor. There's a third component where we're basically just looking for advisors. We pulled out a small portion of that cap table, and we're finding people within the industry that are allowed, given their current occupation or employee status, to participate in private companies, and we're bringing them on on boards. We're providing equity for their opinion. So there's a three-prong approach there. That one that hits professional or uh, non-professional investors, mostly your accredited investors is a network that you have to constantly nurture and feed. Your friend from college introduced you to the CPA. You held a call with the CPA. He really liked it. He says, you know, you need to talk to you. You need to talk to Bob. He's an attorney over here. And you're just following leads with a very specific focus. While at the same time, hitting that list of three to 400 of the professional investors that you've narrowed down through your research and you're working at the follow-up emails, you're answering their questions. That type of approach tends to yield the most amount of fruit. I know that was an incredible amount, but you can imagine what type of detail has to go into it. But if you want to go and raise a million bucks in the United States with this much competition, you're basically committing to a thousand to two thousand hours of your life that's going to take 12 to 18 months. That's going to face less than a 10% success rate. That's brilliant information. That's a really good yeah yeah you've, you've got to hustle you've got to put in the work and that's kind of one thing that we spoke about um, previously and we spoke about in, in private conversations right you get yeah it's not just you put a business plan together and and you've got your documents and your corporate documents um corporate governance docs and you know fossil records and all that stuff and hey there you go you raise some money that's really when the race begins when you get to that stage it's when the work yeah starts. And, and 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 don't don't just look for checkbooks you know like a, a quick little story on the sideline you know, I'm, I'm getting more and more active on LinkedIn, as you know, and I, and I get a lot of great requests and I hear a lot of things, but I'm always looking at everything as a learning opportunity. I was kind of shocked by the number of people, but, I, you know, they reach out to me, they say, hey, what's up? What do you need? Kind of thing. Yeah, I'm, I have a raise going. Okay, great. Yeah. Are you an investor? Are you active right now? Well, technically, we're not active right now. We're focusing on the education. So I'll tell them that. I'm always honest. Boom. Okay. No, you're done. You're not a checkbook. And I'm blown away by that. Is that the approach you're using? So I have to think not everyone is doing that, but he's not alone in how he handled that. So if anyone watching this is wondering on that last question that we just answered of how to find, hopefully you found that helpful, but do everyone on the team a favor. Put the checkbook in the backseat. Just look advice. Look for people that are willing to help. And naturally, I firmly believe if your moral and ethical compass is right of who you're projecting it upon, not only is your life easier, 
But if you're projecting that opportunity and that need on the right audience, you let that audience grow the message. Because if you do that properly, they will hit an audience 10 times more than you sending out emails and LinkedIn and jumping on conference calls and beating your head against the wall. So that's, if anything, out of a couple of decades of this stuff, that's what I would tell people. Yeah, relationships are everything. And just because just because you get an initial no or there doesn't seem to be any interest, it doesn't mean that um, like human capital and, and building friendships and relationships is really, that's what runs the world. And that's how a lot of the world works. So yeah, if you're just going out there and you're doing that one quick hit, you have some money, no, you're probably not. You're probably Next missing one. out on them. Yeah. Because if you would have hit me different and said, you know, let's say that guy was close to where I am and said, you know, my favorite one was when we were starting companies very early on, my mentor told me, we said, okay, how much money do we need for marketing? He goes, don't even think about that. You guys can't afford a marketing plan. And we said, well, we have to do something. And he was, his name was Steve. He says, okay, here's what you do. How many investors do you need to go and find? We had 500 investors. And this was right around the time where Starbucks was just becoming popular. And he goes, 500 investors. You need 1,500 bucks. And we were like, what? Why 1,500 bucks? He goes, three bucks for a cup of coffee, 500 investors. No one knows you outside of your hometown in California. So you get out there and you pound the pavement and you ask for advice. And you ask for relationships. You leave the house with at least 10 cups of coffee in your pocket. And dollars to donuts, Matt, that's how the first one got fun. Yeah, I don't doubt it. Keep it simple. I think people are naturally good. You know, yeah, you're going to meet a few jerks. And you're going to have a few people that are going to have a God complex and they're going to be like, you know, don't have time for you. But if, if you're putting off good energy and you're presenting a, a humble and vulnerable position to say, this is who you are. I've never done it. Could I buy you a cup of coffee sometime? And you give me your opinion on this. It's, it's a game changer for people. It's really insightful advice. And I think that's insightful advice, not just for raising money, but just for life in general. Take the time to get to know the people around you. And that's how you build networks. You don't just... You know, you yeah. Don't, 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 don't lean so heavy on, on, on tech and email. I mean, I know it's easy, but it's incredibly impersonal. You don't build rapport through it, setting your email system and uh, MailChimp to you know drop emails to someone every five days. You got an investor you really want to hit. You've heard me say this before. Spend a hundred bucks, go buy some stationery with your corporate logo on it. Write the guy a letter. Oh, people have laughed at me in the past, but a lot of people have come back and went, Hey man, that really worked. Well, of course. He's a big he's a big fund manager. How many emails do you think he gets? And how many letters do you think a secretary drops off this list? You do the math. So anything that you can do to break out of the impersonal nature that we all lean on and lean into very heavy to build rapport, tell a story, ask for direction or advice. I think that many, many, many founders would be in a much better position. I think a lot of people are probably sitting there wondering how much, if I want to raise some money, how much is it going to cost me? Because there are costs associated with raising capital. And of course, you know, through my learning with you and my learning through your courses, I've come to realize that that number does obviously differ, but if you were to kind of sum up a couple of different scenarios and how much a capital raise might cost somebody from point A to point B, how would you do that? Or you know, how would you express that? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and you know, for, for someone who for, for the last number of years provides consultative services for companies, either in coaching or, or basically little mini IPO packages to get them off and running, it's something that I found a lot of founders don't really have a reference for. All at the same time, a lot of founders, their guards are up, right? They're working typically on a shoestring budget. Fortunately, there's a lot of wackadoodles out there promising a bunch of stuff that typically don't deliver. So I think before you get into cost, we have to really kind of divide up what type of packages a founder is probably preparing. So if we see someone that comes in our office that wants assistance, and they're really in a very early pre-seed like stage, they're looking to raise less than 500,000 bucks. They're not going to get too detailed into the cap table and stock prices. They're going to use some safe notes, which you can use on tokens now, theoretically. So big opportunity there. Then oftentimes, we'll look at them and basically say, you can probably stay away from the hefty legal fees 
and you can probably definitely stay away from marketing. If if you've got a very simplistic raise like that, or it's a smaller amount of money, you're going to use the safe notes. My recommendation is always when you're about to embark on this, have a small retainer with some of these great startup attorneys that are popping up all over the country. You know, at Mindset, we interviewed a good friend of mine, from Traval, Carbon Law Group, really in to not overcharging, but just providing advice. That's number one. If you're in that particular stage, you know, an attorney might cost you 12, 15, I'm about 100 bucks for a retainer. That'll get you a couple of quick phone calls every other month or something like that to make sure you're on the right track. A solid pitch deck, solid materials, I think is an absolute prerequisite regardless of your dollar amount. I'm not just saying that bias because that's what we do, creating great packages, but you are in a technological uh, life as we just talked about. And you live in an ADD society, 280 characters or less, and people eat with their eyes first, just like a shot in it, right? Would you be paying that amount of money or would you be thinking of them if they were putting it, slopping it on the plate like you're sitting at a lunch counter? Probably not. And so if anything, it's all about that behavioral finance perspective for investors. You got a lot of cool companies out there like Slidebeam, really popular on YouTube now. Uh, a very interesting founder, that small monthly subscription creates a lot of the templates for you for pitch decks. You know, if, if someone can't afford what we do, that's oftentimes where I send them great online videos. If you're using the safe note, we'll show them Y Combinator's free school online that you can do. Granted, it's tilted towards Y Combinator, but they did create the safe note. So you can listen from the Y Combinator CFO talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly with safe notes. There's a lot of good retail tools out there. So for you know maybe a thousand bucks, if you're going to do it yourself on your pitch deck and your business plan and lock down a good attorney, you're talking 2,000, 2,500 bucks. And a lot of founders in that early under 500 safe note model can probably get away with it for a lot less if they've got some decent tech and, and design skills, right? So that's bucket number one, a couple of grand. Yeah. The second stage, when you get into the seed, the seed round is a very pivotal point because typically by stan most investors' prerequisite standards, you're not at the point where you're designing the company and building out the team. That was supposed to be in the pre-seed stage. In the seed stage, you're looking to continue to refine the, the product or maybe the pre-seed was the MVP. Now we're going to market and seed is we're really here to test these hypotheses, right? Is this thing really going to fly? That's what the seed is. And typically for your series A, where a lot of investors would say they're series A, they don't want to hear about you testing hypotheses. When you get to a series A, hypotheses are supposed to be done. Yeah. This is basically putting gas in the gas tank for you to scale. So if that pre-seed stage, you can get by a little cheaper because you really just need to make sure you're giving off a professional look, feel, you're properly prepped, and you're not stepping on the legal or regulatory pitfalls. The second one's a little bit different because of the higher expectations of the business model. Now, some founders will go out and find security attorneys that can do these things at 100000 bucks. I think that's complete overkill myself. You know, we're a very small fraction of that of what we do. But the reason that you see the large jump is oftentimes you don't see a lot of seed rounds, at least those seed rounds that are really got their eye on getting to become a big company. By seed round, they've kicked a lot of times the safe notes out, right? You've got too much traction at this point. Now it's time for you to get in there, actually determine a valuation, set a share price, get those guys converted, and really take on the details of this. So now we're looking at a larger business operation to explain. We're looking at a more detailed and robust set of financial projections and maybe even current financials, contrary to what you did in your pre-seed round. We're going after a much larger sum of money, typically, right? The caliber of investor is probably going up. So now I've got a full solicitation marketing plan view, which means now we're into the area of putting together all the regulatory docs or the private placement uh, documents like we do. So you're getting into that area where those that want to do it right, in my opinion, and I could be biased in that aspect, could be anywhere between ten and forty thousand bucks. And there are probably some founders who are watching this guy. He's full of it. I did it for far less. You totally can. You've got the God-given skill sets to be able to fill the gaps. 
go for it. The only thing I caution against, knowing that there's a need, a much higher need of documentation and preparation of something like a seed, is not to just go on Google and find what someone else did and try to mimic it, because that oftentimes is an absolute recipe for disaster. Now, your third category when you're trying to look at cost is more like your Series A and beyond. Now, if I were an investment banker, a Series A means to me probably 25, 30 million and above on a raise. Now, that's work that we also do. We've always had an arm in the institutional space. And in that space, it's, it's going to sound ridiculous for most founders, but that could be an easy 150 to 350,000 for a company to build out. But think about it. You've probably picked up a few hundred investors, right? You got some of them who are maybe restless. Maybe you have some of them that want out. We've got to oftentimes probably go and reevaluate the cap table and the structure. You're about to go play ball and knock on the doors of some of the biggest funds out there. You're not going to have or should really have a strong general counsel on your team. You're going to need a lot of components for the process to build out. So those, I'd say, were the three primary aspects at least from a benchmark rate in terms of cost and what it takes. All of them come with their own caveats. There are plenty of examples and precedents out there of folks going in and doing exactly what I just said with zero capital. And usually that's because, back to our earlier point, they're very good at identifying needs that their organization has, going out and asking for advice and selling those people on the vision and convincing those parties to put in the time and the effort, either for the sake of doing something nice or for the exchange of future value within the company. So there are a lot of companies that that can do that very successfully. If you choose to, you know, just use the checkbook to get it done, I would say those are pretty realistic cost structures for most companies. Yeah, I believe it. I have, um, I still have a pile of questions that I want to ask you. I also know how busy you are. So I'm going to probably give you one more big one to tackle because I don't want to keep this for too long because I know you have a lot on your plate. Um, And the rest we could just shift over. I'd love to keep doing these with you, Erlen. Some of the stuff you've laid down today, I think, is really, really important. Like just tidbits of information that people really could take in. Um, it's just very useful if you're if you're in that position where you're going for a raise or you're a founder or you're going to be in the future. I guess the one thing that keeps coming up, and this is something that I, I kind of wanted to talk about sooner than later because I feel like it's going to come up in a lot of our other subsequent conversations. So I just wanted to get it out there. What are data points? You know, obviously data points are I know this is this could be a this could be a two hour rant, but um, what are what are data points and how do investors look at data points and to make decisions and how ultimately can people's understanding of these particular data points and data sets um, create a raise that's a little bit more structured and a little bit more digestible? Yeah, you're right. It, it, it it's a rather robust one, but I'll I'll, I'll kind of focus on the cliff note version here. Um, you know, if, if, if any of the folks listening don't know, we're, we're at Mindset uh, Academy On Demand. That's our primary website, Mindset Academy On Demand. And you'll see our tagline, which is a new era of metric and data-driven capital raising. So what does that mean? Well, it's a very strong undercurrent that is flowing through the early stage space. And I think to best understand it, you have to sort of look at where we've been. Some 40, 50 years ago, you wanted to raise capital. There was not a lot of accredited investors. There was no Shark Tank. There were many incubators, accelerators, not a few angel groups. So when you wanted to raise capital, it was pretty much an executive summary, a business plan, and some financials. And you went out there and you did your song pitch. As the industry grew more, you started to fill in greater diversity of the investor space. And so too did more and more startups. But then what happened is these investors are reviewing hundreds of deals every year. And let's be honest, they're not all reading your 200 page business. Plan. So then their trend came in where it was like, well, maybe we need something a little lighter. Stole the idea from corporate America. Now you have executive summary, right? Follow that line of thinking on, still needed to condense this. There's more data coming in. I can't hire everyone to read this, right? So then all of a sudden you got the, the pitch deck comes into vote. What maybe? late 90s, early 2000s. And we've pretty much been in that mode for a while. But here's the thing. Attend most investor symposium or expos. 
in the investor space now is, a, I don't want to say crowded, but it's far more robust than it used to be. And it's definitely more crowded on the demand side of the equation of all the founders chasing the same few hundred char- thousand checkbooks. So there's getting to a point here where you're sort of getting paralysis by analysis, where now you've got founders that go online and look at what Uber or Airbnb did on the pitch deck and they do it. Well, put yourself in the investor shoes. You've read a thousand packages, eight to 10 pages each. Company, problem, solution, traction, right? Financial, call me. What do I do with that? I mean, after I've reviewed four, 500 of them, they start to look the same. Now, he or she provided me the business plan, but I've got a hundred of these to review this week. Do I really need to search through? So as we tell the founders, <laughs> when we teach investor due diligence and the data points, it's because we're noticing this bottleneck that's occurring. And we're saying, look, when you're submitting your package to these funds, a lot of times it's going through some form of screening committee or junior associate. It's almost theoretically and mathematically impossible for them to read every package. So what are they doing? They're screening that package for markers, right? Making sure it's the right particular industry which they're interested in. Because some founders don't do a lot of the due diligence we talked about earlier and understand the audience, and they just blast their business plan at everyone. So here I am, a fintech fund. Some guy just sent me a hospitality for real estate, right? So my team up front is filtering all this stuff out. And as you can imagine, that filtering process will get finer and finer and finer. And what is it? Well, those markers that they're digging through, all this package and information is to align with what their investor criteria is, right? Whether it's written down, memorialized on paper, every one of the funds has some level of ethos or thesis that guides their investment decisions. Now, some people say, well, no. He's industry agnostic. He's opportunistic. Okay. But dig deep into that investment policy statement. We all have them. And there's basically do's and there's don'ts. Granted, it might be really vague. Some are really finite. Some might say, I'm willing to take any industry as long as they have these few variables. Others of us might say, I only want this sub-industry within that major industry. And I only want teams of five people. And I want them to be in this geographic location, and I want them to have monthly reoccurring revenue of 50000 go on and on and on. So think about the genesis of the whole history of capital raise. And think about it between the supply and demand side, right? Here's a bunch of demand chasing a little bit of supply and throwing copious amounts of data. And this team is spending an incredible amount of time and resource to go through all of those packages. It's not standardized and burying the leads all over the place, only to find the primary markers that I'm looking for. And when I've done that a few hundred, if not more than a thousand times that year, oh, by the way, I'm probably going to invest free. Incredibly inefficient. So what Mindset Startup Academy, (laughs) excuse me, was designed to do is to teach the investor due diligence process. And within that process is back to what we talked about earlier. There's qualitative and quantitative data points. So what we're doing when someone asks what the data points are, as you did, what we're doing is we're teaching founders and explaining the significance of understanding what these primary data points are, quantitatively and qualitatively. Because as investors, we are all acknowledging that those variables exist. The only question is, it makes it so difficult for founders, as we talked about earlier, is that they're all subjective. So I might be really concerned about regulatory risk, as we discussed, and this guy's not. We might be on the same page in terms of what we want to see at the team, but we might be totally different in terms of what the scalability of that company is. So if you're going against this thousands of different subjective opinions and combinations, look at them like recipes. Data points are the ingredients. And how that uh, investor decides to put them together is their recipe. Well, the same thing with chefs. We all work with the same ingredients. You have, you have millions of different combinations. Same thing. So teaching data points to us is extremely important. Why? Because if a founder can step out of the confines of a business plan with a, you know strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, here's my pitch deck, you know, problem, solution, 
traction, momentum, call me. If we can get them to pull out of that, you are more than those primary pieces. What we want you to be able to do is tell your story, but evolve that story and define it within the criteria that they're already screening for, that already sit within their investment policy state. Let's bypass that process, right? So if you're a founder or one of our students and you learn that information, yes, you're still going to submit your business plan and your investor pitch deck, but we're also going to walk you through how to create an investor due diligence which basically allows you on top of that package that you submit, says, yeah, here's I am. here I am. Here's my business plan pitch deck. Oh, by the way, you might be interested in, these are what we anticipate being our 15 qualitative data points, monthly reoccurring revenue, expected churn rate, or growth rate. Here's a number of uh, pieces in terms of our competition, growth risk. Here's our product defensibility strategy or offensive strategy, see what I'm saying? Yeah. If a majority of the population is all following that process, and I'm the person that's actually reviewing the package. And once someone actually displayed the awareness and the knowledge and did my work for me, then I've separated myself from the pack. And that's all we can really look to do. What are the specific data points? We focus on about 47 of them. I don't have them in front of me, but I can give you the high. From a qualitative perspective, it is about two to three primarily that together in combination, can mathematically prove product market fit. What is that? That means you know how to turn the engine over and produce a handful or a decent amount of happy customers. So knowing that you have a certain amount of monthly reoccurring revenue with some level of growth rate and a high level retention rate, theoretically and mathematically, and then upon the subjective nature, can not prove you've got product market fit. So those are three very key variables right there. A lot of founders might come in and say, well, I haven't produced revenue. So what are your projections, right? It's okay if it's estimated, not actual. We have to give them something to chew on. So if you haven't had those level of thought experiments or blown out the financials, then we probably should because it's probably going to be a question if you get there. Now, you can extrapolate further. So, for example, SaaS companies, you get into certain variables of, of user rate, right? daily usage rate, how long are they on there? What are the average costs? Then you get into things like add-on sales. Then we get into things like the actual cost that it took you per particular customer. Then we look at the average revenue per customer. Then we look at the average lifetime value. Then we look at the competitive risk. What's the growth rate? Is it matching what you're assuming in the growth rate? These are all things that we can't tell a founder that every single investor is going to go through but they're definitely going to have their hand on a handful of them. From a qualitative perspective, data points, as we talked about before, we may not be able to distill that down to a number or a metric or a percentage, but we have to be able to at least define it and not define it in a long chapter, define it in a very simple, concise, reasonable approach. And what you're doing is you're proving to an investor that says, hey, I know, I know, I know that's working in my potential future. So here's the way that we view it. Here's how we think we're going to tackle it. And here's how we're going to stay on top of it, right? So that could be technology risk. What's the product road? Product defensibility, the ability to continue to scale, to keep pace with technology. What about the overall market and size? Where do you see that market size going? What about the competitor risk? Don't ever say there's no competitors. A lot of investors will say, if you have no competitors, you have no business. Right. Mm -hmm. So knowing what those different defined components are, quantitative and qualitative, not being so afraid just because you're pre-revenue or pre-customer that you can't find. Give it a shot. Throw those numbers out there. Because here's the thing is, if you are pre-revenue and you don't have it, the investor already knows that. But if you're sitting across the table from him, then he's waiting to be convinced. So be able to put out what you think that you're actually going to be able to do. Be realistic with it, be reasonable with it, and state it with confidence and conviction, and allow that investor or investors to give you an idea of whether or not they agree or disagree or have a friendly amendment to it. So that's really why we focus on data points. Those are the primary ones that I would like to see more founders, of course, like ours, or listen to, uh, to, to interviews like this, to really take on those particular pieces and define them. Because guess what? We're already looking for them anyway. You might just be making their job harder.
Yeah, absolutely. And understanding those, of course, is going to save you a lot of, as you've kind of said, a lot of running around. And if you're asked, you're in a, you do make it to an interview stage with a VC or with an investor, and they ask you about one of these data points, and it's just something you haven't thought about, then you're probably going to be in a world of hurt. You know what I mean? It's very possible. So Yeah. And, th- and think about the internal benefits too. Like as founders, we tend to make decisions in a vacuum, right? It's the same two to 10 people around us every time. Well, group things starts to happen pretty quickly. And sometimes when we push ourselves to do these level of experiments, I always say, you're putting yourself in the investor's shoes, the best of your ability when you do exercises like this. And if you are being really honest and non-biased and you're doing it properly, you're probably going to find some things that maybe you got wrong, Richard, right? Like you said, oh yeah, we can hit a hundred customers. Sure. Then when we start flushing out the numbers and we're looking at it, we're like, wait a minute. What we said, it sounds realistic to us, but what it equates to when we did the, the data points is it equates to a 25% annual growth rate. Well, I also did my market research to have those data points ready, and the market's only growing at five. So maybe we should go back through the numbers because how is an investor going to see this? Are they going to agree with me or they think that I'm smoking something? that I'm going to outpace the market by more than 500%. See what I'm saying? Sometimes that ability to just sort of keep yourself honest, make sure you're not drinking too much of your own Kool-Aid, even though the front-end numbers might look well, take the exercise to shake it out. You might find cause to circle back to some of the original assumptions, even if you believe them possible. But because you're looking at it the way an investor could, you might say, maybe we might want to tone that one down. Always better to underpromise and over deliver. Brilliant advice and um, just a really good interview, Verlin. I really appreciate all the kind of little tidbits that you put out. I think if anybody's watching who is in the position where they are a founder, going to be a founder in the process of um, doing a raise or going to be doing a raise in the future, a lot of what you said is really relevant and it's fantastic. I also really highly encourage anybody who is looking to either raise money or is a founder um, to go and check out some of Berlin's services. I'm going to make sure I put the link below. Berlin does a variety of different things. I actually originally paid for your course. Um, It was probably one of the best investments I made. I loved it. I learned a ton. Um, I still use it for reference all the time for various clients that I'm working with. Of course, um, you do full scale consulting where you'll, you'll walk people kind of from the baby steps right on through. And then you have some other things, including the Slack channel. So I really advise anybody to go and check Berlin out. Not only is he fantastic at what he does, he's a good human, a good person yeah. and uh, insightful and just fun to, fun to talk to and be around. So Berlin, thank you so much. I look forward to doing our next one and you have yourself a fantastic day. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Appreciate it, Matt. Bye. See you, bro. Bye-bye.